Greetings, and welcome to the Matt Asher Radio Show, coming at you from Moray Bay Studios, where the waters are shallow and the conversations are deep. My guest today is Michael Humer. Michael is a professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado. He's written a number of provocative articles and books, including The Problem of Political Authority, an examination of the right to coerce and the duty to obey. Michael, welcome to the show. All right. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Your work is fascinating. And one of the first things I thought about as I began to dig into it is that our world is is ruled by analogies. The analogies that we use, they control it to some extent how we see the world. They provide a, a framework of understanding the lens through which we see things. And they become so deeply rooted that they don't even register as an analogy. For example, we talk all the time about time as if it were movement. So we move into the future, the past is behind us, we look ahead, try to get ahead, we fear falling behind. Those metaphors can be problematic sometimes if we don't really understand them. Your book is about one central metaphor that we use to understand the state. Maybe you could start us off by telling us about that metaphor that justifies the existence of the state. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is a metaphor. Um, it's just that people think that the state has this special kind of authority, right? Which means that it gets to tell everybody else what to do and, uh, and we have to obey them, right? Uh, you know, in the book, I use a lot of arguments by analogy, right? So it's sort of like if I were to go around the neighborhood telling everyone, hey, you know, you owe me money for protection. <laughs> I'm going to protect you from criminals and now you have to pay me money, you know, even though you never agreed to do it right. And uh, if you don't pay me, I'm going to kidnap you and lock you in a cage, right? <clears throat> okay, so, you know, that's analogous to what the government is doing. And, you know, most people say that I, I cannot do that. That would be wrong, right? It's not only illegal, it would be wrong. And also that if I start doing that, they don't have any obligation to pay me, right? They don't owe me any anything. Um, and so, you know, that seems similar to what the government is doing. So, you know, why is it okay for them to do it, right? That is the central question. The answer to that is often that there is a, a social contract that we have, and we all live under this assumption that we're supposed to do this because they're doing this other thing, and that makes everything kosher. Yes, right. Yeah. And, you know, the only problem with that is that it's just completely factually false, right? I mean, I, I always thought the social contract theory was bizarre because it's just like so blatantly flying in the face of reality, right? Like nobody ever offered you that contract. I mean, like nobody ever offered you a choice, neither verbally nor in writing, right? And, you know, if they did, there are some people who would reject it like the anarchists, for example, would refuse to accept it. And then the government just says, well, you, you agree anyway. <laughs> you know, like, you know, even if you're explicitly saying that you don't agree, we're just going to say that you agree anyway. And so you have to obey us, right? So it's a, a social contract, but it's essentially a unilateral one. Yeah, you know, just like a contract, except that you have no choice, <laughs> right? What's, what's that? What's just like a contract, but you have no choice? Um, enslavement, I guess, right? You know, like uh, David Friedman makes this remark that, um, you know, what, what do you call it if uh, you have an employment offer that you are not allowed to turn down? We call that slavery, right? Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, when you take away the element of getting to decide whether to accept it or not, you take away the whole point of contract. Right. Like the whole point of that is that there's supposed to be voluntary agreement on both sides. So the, the metaphor that we live under this social contract might be better rewritten in our heads as the metaphor that we live under a protection racket or a mafia. Yeah, that is a much better comparison. Right. Um, you know, so, yeah, interestingly, they're offering us protection. And by the way, the mafia also provides protection. 
right? Like if other criminals come and mess with you, then you can go to the mafia boss and they will pick them up. <laughs> and that's just like the government, right? They're stealing your money. And if somebody else comes along and tries to steal your money, you can go to them and, and they will pick up the other criminal, right? Right. But also just like the mafia, you don't, uh, you don't get a choice, right? You just have to pay for their service, whether you want to or not. Right. And then, you know, people, so the most popular thing for people to say is, oh, but you're living in the government's territory. And like, if you don't want to agree to pay them, then you just have to leave. And this is just like the mafia boss saying, oh, well, you're living in your own house in your neighborhood. And, you know, if you don't want to pay me money, you have to leave, right? You have to leave your own house from your own neighborhood uh, if you don't want to pay me. And by living here, you're agreeing to pay me, right? Um, that would not pass muster, right? That would, you know, any, anyone else who said that, we would just laugh at them. One of the things that made the American experiment perhaps different was that the the idea was that the government was beholden to the people. This was, in some sense, a formalization of the social contract in favor of the contractee in the sense that this is a, a contract that's being offered to you. It's being done explicitly for your benefit. And if you don't like it, you can dissolve it. That's, on paper anyway, uh, one way to view the founding of the nation. Well, I mean, that so that philosophy is in the Declaration of Independence, right? Like from Jefferson, that if the government is not protecting your rights, then it's the right of the people to alter or, or abolish it. But, you know, if you try that out, it's not going to go so well, right? If you say, okay, well, I don't like it, so I'm exercising my right to dissolve the government. Um, and then what? <laughs> and then, you know, you just stop paying, stop paying taxes, stop obeying the laws. Yes. And then the next thing is that they send armed men to your house to kidnap you, right? And lock you in a cage for several years. Right. So, you know, not, not going that great. Um, you know, you might think, oh, well, because we have a democratic system, you can like vote out the politicians, right? But, you know, what if, so first, what if I don't want the whole system, like, you know, what if I don't want the government as a whole? It's not just that I want the other candidate to be in office. I don't want the office to exist. Then what do I do? Right. There's you know, nothing you can do about that. Uh, also, you know, what if you want somebody in office who's not running and like you didn't like any of the candidates who are running? Right. Which, by the way, is very common actually in a democracy and, and in our society in particular. It's very common that people don't like any of the candidates that they were offered, right? So then they vote for one anyway, but that does not mean that they actually support that person, right? It just think, means that they think the other person was even worse, right? So anyway, this is not that great. One of the things I like about the, your book is that we're separating out the, the moral and the practical here and exposing that there isn't any real moral weight behind the argument uh, in favor of this this imaginary contract that you didn't have a choice to sign, but then that still leaves you with the practical situation. What are you going to do about it? If if you're using the analogy of a mafia in general, you have four possible avenues that I can see, and I think that that applies equally well to the government. You can you can obey. You can go along. Um, you can, uh, you, you can try to hide, you know, slip through the cracks and just sort of find spaces where you can just be, you can try to fight or lobby, I guess would be another way to put that in some sense, what the government is doing. You can push back against the mafia essentially, or try to influence the mafia, um, or you can replace it and replacing it can happen in a variety of different ways and may be very difficult to do. But it seems like if you if you start with the analogy of the mafia, then maybe your obligation, so to speak, as a citizen is not necessarily to go along with the mafia, but it's to think at a practical level, which of those four strategies is going to suit you the best. Yeah, right. Um, you know, like, ideally, you would like to change it, but that's you know, almost impossible, right? One of the ways that government is worse than the market, right? Is that if you're not happy with it, if you're not happy with something that you get from the market, 
you can just stop buying it and go to their competitor. If you're not happy with the services you're getting from the government, it's not so easy to do anything, right? You can say, oh, well, I'm going to vote against a different, I'm going to vote for a different politician next time, right? But when you do that, that only makes a difference if the other voters are tied. That's not the way it works in the market, right? Like if you say, oh, well, I don't like this, um, I don't like this product I'm getting, I'm going to buy from a different brand, then you just get the different brand immediately. But you know, there's not, not much that you can do about the government if you don't like them. Continuing along with that kind of analogy that the government is the protection racket or the mafia, certainly replacing that isn't necessarily going to be an easy thing. And I think it's also the case that one of the things that that uh, mafia will try to do is co-opt industry and bring them under its umbrella so that you may have had a marketplace, but at some point you cease to have that marketplace because all of the big players in it become essentially state actors. I think this is where we're at right now. I don't see any meaningful distinction. I don't see the existence of a robust marketplace that it operates outside of the framework of what the government is telling it to do and back and forth lobbying, back scratching, log rolling, all those other things. So I don't really see much escape in the market except at the, the most local level. Yeah, uh, you know, fair fair point. I mean, the various companies have to obey the government, otherwise the government will f- them up, and and so on. But I mean, there there is meaningful choice. Like you know, you can decide if you're buying a product, you can decide whether you want the product or not, whether it's worth the price, and you can decide which provider. And then, you know, it can actually be effective. Sometimes there are significant differences between products and then you can make a decision and you actually get the thing. So that's pretty good. Uh, Of course, we don't have like, you know, we don't have a pure free market, right? So a lot of things are less good than they could be, but it's a lot better than uh, government provided services, right? Like literally directly government provided services where you typically only have one option. That's certainly the case. Uh, mostly it's, it's thinking of it as a continuum from uh, actors in a, a perfectly free market where you have tons of competition and choice and they can offer whatever they want versus the other extreme where you have the DMV. Right, yeah. For sure, for sure. So you, uh, what, I, what I see in this often and um, what I think that, the governments have been particularly effective at is is sort of driving that analogy of the social contract or the bilateral obligation so deeply into people's mentalities that stepping out from that is is seen as immoral so that you you have somehow acquired this duty to the state that you didn't even realize that you, you know, that you entered into, and now you're kind of stuck with it. I think that to a large extent, morality itself over time is mostly used as a a tool for the elite or or rulers to straitjacket the people who would otherwise dethrone them. Yeah. By the way, I mean, I wanted to comment on this, you know, because at the beginning you mentioned there's supposed to be a bilateral obligation. I just wanted to comment on another thing that's wrong with a social contract, right? Which is it's not bilateral, right? Like the government doesn't recognize any obligation whatsoever to you. And, you know, you might, you might, people may not be aware of this. And, you know, when I tell students about this, many of them are shocked, but uh, like, you know, the police have no obligation to protect you, right? So like if you're being beaten up on the street and a cop walks by, he doesn't have to do anything, you know, legally speaking, he has no duty to do anything. So if he just like stands there and watches you getting beaten up and then later you complain about it, you're SOL, right? (laughs) You're like, you try to sue the police department because like, you know, the whole police department were standing around watching you getting beaten. Your case is going to be summarily dismissed by the courts because government, you know, U S government courts will say, no, governments have no obligation whatsoever to do anything for any individual, right? So like, you know, this is like the exact opposite of a contract, right? Like, first of all, it's not voluntary on your part. Secondly, they take on no, they agree to do nothing for you. 
this is the opposite of the social contract. Uh, anyway, okay, anyway, I, I forgot what your main question was. No worries, and I am talking with Michael Humer here on Keys Talk FM, and we're talking about the problem of political authority and the ways in which the state may or may not be essentially a mafia. One of the things about a mafia is that it does usually assume the responsibility of keeping you safe from people who aren't them. So it may be a protection racket, but part of that, uh, the protection part of that protection racket is an implied uh, contract, I suppose, with the mafia. If you think about someone who's coming into your business and shaking you down for money, part of the implied contract there is that they will prevent other people from coming in and shaking you down for money as well, or they will provide some other forms of protection if a gang of hooligans comes and wants to smash your windows. What you're saying is, in essence, the government doesn't even rise to the level of uh, of an obligation that you might feel like you're getting from a, a mafia that's shaking you down. I don't know how well the mafia does either. Like, don't, don't really have knowledge of that. I mean, they will, they will generally um, protect you from the other criminals. Also, the cops will generally protect you from the other criminals. But if they don't, you have no recourse. So I suspect it's the same as in the mafia case, right? Like in the event that the mafia guys didn't protect you from another criminal and then you go complain about it, I suspect you have no recourse at all. They will just laugh in your face, right? Or, or you know, they'll say, oh, well, better luck next time. You know, <laughs> next time the criminals, whatever, but they're not going to like pay you compensation or anything. And that's the same as the government. You go complain to the government, hey, you know, I called the police, nobody ever came. And like now these people broke into my house and raped me, um, you know, go complain to the government about that. And they're like, oh, too bad. Right. There's no uh, consequences for their inability to uphold their side of the contract. If it truly was a, a social contract, I suppose you could sue them for failing to uphold their side of it. Yeah, that's right. Like in, you know, in contract doctrine, the in the government's own contract doctrine, uh, if there's a contract and one party breaches it and the other party suffers harm as a direct result, you know, the part, party who suffered harm can sue the other one. But the government will not recognize this in the case of the, quote, social contract, which means the government itself doesn't recognize this as a contract, right? So what do you do? Yeah, what do you do? Uh, I mean, you know, what What I was sort of hoping when I wrote the book was that someday we will get a better social system, right? The, the better social system would be anarcho-capitalism. So t uh, what what is anarcho-capitalism? So basically, I want to privatize the functions of the government, or rather the good functions of the government. I want to be privatized, and the bad things they're doing should just stop. Right. So like, uh, oh, we need police protection, but uh, it doesn't have to be run by the government. You know, we could privatize that. We could have private security companies, you know, patrolling neighborhoods and there could be multiple different competing security companies. And then, you know, people in the neighborhood could choose which company they wanted to hire. So there would be meaningful competition. Right. And then, you know, Maybe we could expand this to the point where one day we don't need government police anymore, right? Yeah. Oh, and so, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, like what would be the advantage of this? Um, you know, you hear a lot about um, police violence, like we've been hearing for the past year. Um, they kill around 1,100 people a year. And many people think that this is excessive, right? Uh, American police kill a lot more civilians than police in other countries per unit of population. You don't hear a lot of stories about security guard violence. Wonder why that is. Well, uh, it really does have to do with the fact that the government has a monopoly. So because they have a monopoly, they have a monopoly on like, you know, the whole governing system. And so they just grant their own police immunity, right? This qualified immunity, like it's extremely difficult to sue the police if they murder you. <laughs> Right. And then it's like, you know, it's it's not impossible, but it's extra hard. And, you know, security guard companies don't have that. The other thing is there's competition among private companies. There's not competition when the government takes over something. Right. So like if if you're not happy with your police department, you can't say, OK, well, I'm just going to fire them and hire the other police department because there is no other. It's a monopoly because that's the nature of government. 
right? They set up one agency to do this and then nobody else is allowed to compete with them. And so like, that's another reason why they have low quality, right? There's no consequence for them if they mess up and it's different for private companies. Perhaps then the answer, if possible, would be that we could uh, choose not just which mafia to represent us, but maybe choose some overlapping subset of them. I've heard the the term, I think it's panarchy, to describe the ability of each person to choose who is, I guess, the the providers of security. Yeah, I mean, you know, one way of imagining it is each individual hires a security company um, that's that strikes me as probably not efficient and probably local homeowners associations would hire security for their area, for their neighborhood or their building or whatever. Uh, and, you know, business owners would hire security for their business because they don't want there to be a lot of crime in their place of business. Right. And that would play out in the same way we see the kind of private wall gardens like Disneyland or something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So like they provide security for their area. And why do they do this? Because their customers don't want to be victimized by criminals while they're there. And if that is happening, then customers are going to stop coming. So they want to provide the kind of security that will make their customers feel safe and happy to go there. Right. Which is presumably the lightest touch possible, but still maintaining safety for everyone in the park. Uh, yeah, like, so, you know, customers don't want there to be crime, but they also don't want to be harassed when they're not doing anything. And they don't want to be beaten up or shot, right? Just because they happen to be reaching into their pocket to grab a phone or something, right? They don't want any of those things. And yeah, so, you know, there's some pressure against the police because there's like political pressure, but it's not very much, right? Um, you know, largely because, well, there's not a competing police agency. So it should be noted that in the, the case of the park, people, no one wants to be harassed if they haven't done anything wrong. But the attitudes towards the people who clearly have done something wrong might range from, you know, kick them gently out of the park to string them up and hang them from the, you know, the, the Disney lamp posts. Uh, and the, the customers at, at Disney might be just as happy to have them strung up as kicked out. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. So, you know, you know, a priori, you might think that, but what do they actually do? Yeah, they have a pretty light touch, right? Actual security guards. They don't, they don't like beat the crap out of people. Um, and they're, you know, pretty polite, right? At least, you know, in my experience. And then if they think that you're well, doing something there, wrong. There's just... some bars that you haven't been to, obviously. <laughs> yes. I... <laughs> I'm uh, talking here with Michael Humer on Keys Talk FM, and we will pick up right after the break. You are listening to the Matt Asher Radio Show on Keys Talk FM, and I am talking with Michael Humer, author of the book, The Problem of Political Authority. And we were talking about the idea of the state as mafia and private security and so on. But I want to move away from that for a moment, and maybe we'll get back to that. You are working on a broader system of ethics that I see both in that book and in others. I think it's called intuitionism. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, okay. So, well, ethical intuitionists hold um, a, a couple of views. One is that there are objective values. And another is that we know about them partly, well, we know about them ultimately on the basis of something called ethical intuition, All right? So I'll explain both of those. Like, what do I mean by objective values? Uh, there are truths about what is right or wrong, good or bad, which do not depend upon observers' attitudes towards those things. So like, uh, it's wrong to torture babies. And that's wrong regardless of how you feel about it. Like, if you like baby torture, it's still wrong. If society approved of it, it, was, it would still be wrong, right? If it was legal, it would still be wrong. Okay, so, you know, that's what I mean about objectivity. It uh, doesn't matter if you like it, approve of it, desire it, believe that it's wrong or whatever, you know, still wrong. Um, the point about ethical intuition. Um, so, the word intuition is a technical term in philosophy. It is not the ordinary English usage. It is, you know, where they refer to women's intuition or whatever. Um, so it refers to, uh, there's a kind of experience in which something seems to you to be the case. 
right, which I refer to as an appearance or seeming. And there are different kinds of seemings. An intuition is uh, an intellectual seeming that is not dependent on argument, right? In other words, something seems to you to be the case when you reflect intellectually about it, but not, uh, not in the light of some argument for it. Okay, so when you think about, uh, you just think about certain examples, something will strike you as right or wrong. So here's an example of it that um, is commonly given in ethics. Um, there's this runaway trolley that is headed for five people who are on a track and they can't be moved out of the way in time. So if you do nothing, the trolley kills five people. There's a switch and you can switch it onto another track. And if you do that, it will hit and kill only one person. So should you switch the trolley? Okay, and then um, most people, when they think about this, just have a reaction that it seems like you should switch it. And so that is an ethical intuition. And uh, I give this partly because, you know, there are interesting contrasts. So a famous contrast case is, okay, there's a runaway trolley. It's going to hit the five people. You could push one very heavy person in front of the trolley. And this person is so heavy that he will stop the trolley before it hits the other five. Should you push the one person in front of it? And then most people's reaction is, no, you should not. Okay, so this is interesting because these two cases are otherwise similar, but there's a fairly reliable intuitive reaction you can expect from people. Right? You know, fairly large majorities, although um, not, uni not universal, right? There's some people who think you shouldn't turn the trolley, okay? Um, all right, and um, if you ask people to explain why they have different reactions to these cases, um, almost no one is able to give an answer that makes sense, right? People will say stuff that, they will say some explanation, but it will be easily refutable. It'll just, you know, obviously turn out that that is not the difference. For example, what would they say? Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I describe this, people will say something like, oh, but the five people were already on the track. Well, I, I describe this with different examples, so... Um, <laughs> You know, so not so good, but that that actually doesn't seem like such a bad response to me in the sense that you're assuming that these put people put themselves in danger, and sure you'd like to save them, but that uh, that fat guy didn't put himself in danger. You're killing him. So yeah. I, I I see the I see the logic behind that. At any rate, I don't see it as yeah. uh, incoherent. Yeah, yeah. So what if the five people did not put themselves there? Right, somebody else put them there. <laughs> right, and then you. But you still think that you can't push the one guy in front of it, right? Um, and, you know, like another thing people would say is, uh, oh, um, if you're, are you the trolley operator? Because then you might have like special obligations, like maybe you have an obligation to your company to reduce its liability or some bullshit like this, whatever. Um, okay. But, you know, that doesn't differentiate between the two cases. Right. It's like... So, um, so then where do you go that with that in terms right. of, uh, yeah. Okay. But it, yeah. So mm -hmm. part, part of the point I want to make here is, um, the, the sense that people have about these cases is not based upon a theory and it's not something that they were taught. It's something else, right? Nobody ever taught you the answers to these cases. You could hear these cases for the first time ever in your life, and you will probably have the standard reaction. Right. So that shows that there's something else going on here. Right. And and also, like I say, it's not based on a theory because uh, most people can't give you any account of why they have different reactions to these cases. And in fact, like their background beliefs about morality, if you ask them um, their beliefs about, you know, what's what's the correct theory of morality, it will almost certainly not match those judgments, but they will still have those judgments. So that shows that there is this thing called intuition where you can think about the case and then, um, you know, the, the morally correct result will just sort of strike you in a certain way. So this seems to me just another way of saying that we all have our assumptions and that these are almost universally shared among us and that we're just basically taking these as, I don't know, as axioms, precepts, as as our assumptions about what is right and wrong and then building from there. And then you're taking that and going, well, those are objective 
and reflect an underlying reality. Is that uh, what we're looking at? Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure because I'm not sure how we're using assumptions and axioms, right? So I wouldn't call this an assumption. Like, I don't think that I'm just randomly assuming that it's wrong to push the guy in front of the trolley. I think that I am seeing that it's wrong, right? Uh, but also, like, um, I mean, I'm not sure that I would call it an axiom either, because, like, I'm not saying this is unrevisable. Like, it's open to discussion, um, but this is, it's a reasonable starting point, right? If it seems to most people that you can flip the switch, but you can't push the guy, then a reasonable starting point for ethical discussion is that those are the correct judgments, unless somebody can come up with a reason for thinking otherwise, right? But I'm open to hearing arguments to the contrary, right? So, so basically, we should default to believing that these intuitions reflect the reality of what is good and what is bad. Right, yeah. It's like a default position, right? The presumption is that things are the way they seem. And that's true, not, that's not only true in ethics, that's true in all of life, right? The rational starting point is, let's assume everything is the way it seems, unless we have a reason to think that it's not. Throughout most of history, it seems that uh, ethics and morality have been, I think, as I said in the last segment, they're mostly a, a tool to get compliance out of people who you want to get compliance out of, or they're completely absent in the form of tribal warfare, where there may be moral uh, morality around doing harm to your own tribe, but anything that you do to anyone else outside of that, that is outside the realm of ethics or morality. And it, it's interesting that what we've done more recently is, it seems like, taken more and more of morality and applied it to more and more things. Whereas before it might be that m morality required an obligation to your family, your clan, tribe, but then it didn't extend out beyond that. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, about your first comment that morality is a tool for getting compliance. I mean, that makes it sound like somebody designed morality, right? But of didn't course, nobody, they? No, nobody did, right? It's like, um, nobody decided, you know, sort of like with language, right? Nobody decided one day, I'm going to, going to invent language, right? It, it was it, a, you're saying it emerged, which, was, which I, could, yeah. I could believe, yeah. right? It, it yeah. emerges, but it emerges with a particular form that tends to, in most cases, suit those with power. Do you disagree? Um, um, I'm not sure if it suits those with power, per se. I mean, um, yeah, I guess it, well depends upon what the moral system is, right? But so, you know, it was a spontaneous order and it's sort of like part of human nature. Um, but yeah, does it, well, does it serve the interests of those in power? Yeah, I guess it depends. Um, Historically, I think the argument is pretty clear that the things that people believed in the age of kings was not surprisingly that the kings were gods. The things that people believed in the, you know, the age of particular domination by certain religions was that, you know, the pope was infallible and you could never question them. And if you did, you were a heretic who would burn in hell. Yeah. So, I mean, the pope being infallible is... I mean, that's not a moral claim. That's sort of like, that's a, it's a weird metaphysical claim, right? But, but be that as it may, yeah. I mean, I was thinking of things like, oh, well, you shouldn't murder your neighbors and steal from them and so on, right? So like a lot of, a lot of these precepts that we normally accept are kind of necessary for, us, for just society to work, right? Necessary for people to get along with each other. Okay, but now, of course, if you have um, a central authority figure, if you have a state, they are going to try to influence people's beliefs in their own favor. Like the state is going to try to propagandize the people to believe that the state is great and that you have to obey the state, right? And, you know, so like they're going to run these schools where people get taught the social contract theory or whatever in order to try to convince people that they have to obey the government, right? Of course, they're going to do that, right? I suppose in an evolutionary sense, what you'd expect to see is that uh, what you'd have were moral systems that that 
provided at least some minimal set of rules for a viable society. But beyond that, any other rules would be subject to uh, to, to infighting until whoever decided those or whatever forces pushed them into place uh, would would be the one that would benefit from them. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, certainly like the, the most powerful members of society are typically going to use their power to serve their own interests because, you know, human beings are selfish, right? And so that will include trying to influence the conventions, but it's not far from guaranteed that they can succeed, right? That's certainly the case. And it's, I think in this particular era in which we live, those ideas that succeed are the ones that are viral to some extent. We live in a mimetic culture right now where ideas can spread very quickly around the whole world and movements can be sparked out of nothing into people rioting in a widespread way in the streets within a matter of days. Where that leaves things in terms of what we what we think about uh, morality and the right thing to do as far as, you know, is it the right thing to do to smash in that window? I'm not sure actually where that leaves us. Yeah. And so this is a good example because like recently we're seeing how the government doesn't have all that much power, right? I mean, if the government comes into conflict with you and as an individual, they're going to win. But if the government is in conflict, conflict with, you know, wide swath of society, you know, frequently they can't, they they just fail, right? Like they want everybody to get vaccinated, but half the people are not doing it and they don't know what to do about it, right? Or, you know, people will just be like rioting and they just can't stop it. Right. So what they, what they will do about it and have been doing about it is increasingly ramp up the, the pressure and the moral arguments. If you don't do this, you are, you know, you're killing grandma, which has been the argument throughout the entire pandemic that any action that you take that, uh, that we don't like is killing grandma. I think it's, it's interesting in terms of the argument there of these things tend to align with what the powers want, that every ethical thing, everything you were told to do to be an ethical, morally proper person from the beginning of the pandemic has also coincidentally benefited Amazon and given politicians more power. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, you know, I, w- I want to point out that like how well does this argument work, right? Like a lot of people just scoff at that. And I want to say it, it only works to the extent that a large portion of ordinary people are on board, right? So like you're not going to be pressured into the putting on the mask or getting vaccine or whatever because your local politician said it unless there's like a bunch of people around you, like, you know, your peers around you who are saying it too, Right. Right, though we could have gone in any particular direction, we happened to go in the direction that uh, was beneficial to interests that were already powerful in one way or another. Right, so, yeah. so that was the response was the one that aligned with that uh, particular approach. I, I will let you uh, reply to that, and then we'll talk perhaps about some other things, including yeah, yeah. the extraordinary weirdness that is veganism, uh, which yeah. I think you have some involvement with. That's after not the so break. weird. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. All right, uh, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Matt Asher Radio Show on Keys Talk FM. I am talking with Michael Humer. He is the author of a book about political authority. And we were talking about Amazon and how they happen to be huge beneficiaries from the particular response to the pandemic, as were other powerful interests, which to me, is not a shock. And we were talking about this in particular in the context of of ethics and what people believe is a moral way to be. And it just so happened that the more the the ethical view that was being pushed was also the one that benefited Amazon. Yeah, and I, I wanted to say, I mean, almost anything that happens benefits some powerful people, and also you know harms others. So, like there are lo- there are many companies that did very badly because of the pandemic, right? You know, like, Not really big ones, though. 
the s- small ones, certainly small businesses were um, were very seriously shafted. But if you look at the at the top ones, they seem to have done exceptionally well. Um, you know, I, I bet if I go do some searching on the internet, um, I can find companies that lost a ton of money. But so it would basically be companies that had um, you know in-person services. Right. So like some large restaurant chain or large hotel chain, uh, Boeing took a dive, although they've they've recovered. And, and they were bailed out all of the. So that was the dual approach was um, to sacrifice all the mom and pops and bail out the mid-level folks and some of those folks. And then Walmart was never shut down. Right. Yeah. So but um, like, I don't think that um, I don't think that this does a great job of predicting policies. And I think you're sort of like underselling ideology, right? Like people do a lot of stuff because they have like a ideological belief. So I think this, the thing about the pandemic has now become a point of ideology where like the left-wing ideology is sort of hawkish on, on the pandemic and the right-wing ideology is sort of um, more complacent, I guess. Uh, And, you know, it's, it's not, and the, and there are lots of like just ordinary people who are on one side or the other, and they're not thinking, oh, let me try to maximize Jeff Bezos's wealth. Oh, they're they're not certainly thinking about that. But when the policy response was crafted, it was certainly crafted, keeping in mind who had the power to push back and who didn't. Oh yeah. That, so that seems plausible, right? But I mean, um, that's different from the way it sounded at first, right? Because you made it sound like um, almost like there's this conspiracy where like Jeff Bezos is pulling the strings or, right? They're just trying what to I'm, like- What I'm saying is that let's let's take a look at um, at ethics or morality as this, as this basket, right? And it's to some extent malleable or clay or whatever it is. And it can be shaped to some extent, but then it it breaks. And when you are when you're talking about things in the political realm and responses, you have to do something that is you know that is going to be within the margins of acceptability to the population overall. And then you have to sell them on that. And the way that you're going to sell them on that is by convincing them that their morality requires that they go in this particular direction. It's not to be conspiratorial. It's just to say that powerful interests take care of themselves. I think that that's just a a fact of the universe. And they'll do everything they can to push a set of positions like, for example, you know, you're not killing grandma if you, you know, if you go to Walmart, but you are um, killing them if you go to the local restaurant or, you know, or, and then that breaks down, right? We saw that with the BLM riots, right? It was, the outrage was so overpowering that that narrative that going outside was killing grandma broke down, right? So it can be, it can be stretched, the ethics can be pushed, but then something will happen, especially as I say, in this culture that is very mob driven, which is another way of saying mimetic, um, that, that will sometimes override that. Yeah. Okay. Sounds fair. Maybe we'll leave that there for the moment, because I do, before uh, our time is up, want to talk about your opinion that you are a vegan, uh, which I, I call an opinion because I anytime I try to examine how food gets on my table, whether it is uh, beef or whether it's rice, there are animals that are harmed and die, and certainly many, many insects along the way. So talk me through how you get to be a vegan and how you reconcile that with the number of dead animals that inevitably end up along the way to getting your food on the plate. I like to um, just tell people this uh, statistic. We're killing around 74 billion animals per year worldwide uh, to eat them. And, you know, something like 99% of those are on factory farms. And life on factory farms is basically torture, i.e. you would call it torture if anyone did that to human beings. So it's like having 74 billion creatures tortured and then killed every year. There have only ever been about 110 billion humans in the entire history of the earth. So a couple of years of factory farming tortures and kills more creatures than the total number of human beings who ever existed in all of time. Right. So 
uh, it's hard to see how this could be justified by the amount of pleasure that we're getting, right? Okay, now, and you know, your claim is, oh, but it's unavoidable that we sometimes kill some animals, right? But so what does that mean? Does that mean that we should just not, not do anything, don't make any effort, right? Um, yeah, I mean, so here's something that I think is analogous. Um, when people build skyscrapers, um, periodically somebody dies, you know, during the construction. And in fact, like if you build a big building, you can predict that some people are going to die. Um, so conclusion, murder anyone, anytime. <laughs> Just, you know, don't worry about killing people. It's great. <laughs> no, right. Uh, proper conclusion is, well, let's minimize it as much as possible, right? I, I'm sympathetic to that, certainly from the perspective that I... I believe in marginality is one of the main principles that we need to have in that you can't look at a situation and necessarily say that um, it is either all one thing or another. Uh, change happens on the margin. I think actually morality happens on the margin in terms of moving in the direction of, of better and better things. I also am sympathetic to the argument that factory farming is particularly brutal in some ways, though I don't see an escape hatch in terms of thinking that because you are, you know, you're consuming only certain foods that that there aren't animals being killed. And certainly, I think you need to take into account that not all life forms are, it, it's a tricky thing, but in some sense equally valuable or equally even worth protecting. I actually don't think you can get around that because if you are eating a particular diet, whatever it is, that's going to cause a certain set of insects or animals to be killed along the way. Whereas if you're consuming some other plant or animal, then that's going to be another set of, you know, of plants or animals that will be necessarily killed as you do everything from, you know, from uh, sending the tractor through the field and killing whatever bugs or animals might be there to, you know, to driving the roads to everything else to get it to your plate. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, are you saying that everything we do is equally harmful? What I'm, what I'm saying is that I don't see the claim that a vegan is a person who kills no animals as legitimate. I see perhaps the claim that eating uh, less meat or eating no meat means that the factory farms that, uh, that kill those particular animals go away. I see the claim, I see this actually as a legitimate claim that keeping, you know, keeping pigs in abhorrent conditions and, you know, and slaughtering them in particular ways is worse than smashing thousands of insects with your tractor on the way through the field. I think that's actually an argument one could have, but I think any argument has to start with the recognition that that is what's happening, one or the other. Yeah. So, you know, like... I mean, like my example about the buildings was to make the point that, well, like there's there's no life that where there's no harm, right? Uh, unless we, you know, the only way for human beings to never cause any harm is for us to go extinct, okay? Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to minimize our harm, right? And, you know, you have to think about, well, is the particular harm that I'm causing worth the benefit? And Right, so, you know, when you think about the, just like horrible suffering that's going on on the factory farms, you got to think, is it worth it for the extra pleasure that I get, right? But it, I, it has to be worth it relative to what? I mean, in in your own, personally, in your own framework of morality, which is worse, one tortured and killed cow or, you know, a thousand killed grasshoppers? Yeah, well, I mean, I want to point out that like the grasshoppers are going to die if you eat meat too, because when they raise the animals, they have to feed the animals some food and they have to feed the animals more food than the food that they get out of it at the end. Right? So actually more insects are going to die in addition to the pigs and the cows and whatever. My guest today has been Michael Humer, and if you are interested in our full conversation, I should ask, actually, Michael, are you okay to stick around for a little bit for the podcast-only section? Let's do it. 
Excellent, excellent. So we will continue this on the podcast. A reminder that every episode of this show is wrapped up into a podcast after it's broadcast. And you can get that at madasher.com. Just go there and download the content. Welcome to all the podcast listeners. Let's just continue our discussion here with Michael Humer. And I want to talk about war uh, because it's a fascinating topic, and it is one that comes in your uh, into play in your book. Tell me about war. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that I wonder about is why wars occur. I wondered this for a long time because it seems kind of crazy, right? Like large numbers of people are killing each other, and uh, most people don't want to die. Like, okay, and, you know, because people are selfish and assholes or whatever, you can maybe understand why they would want to kill each other. The problem is when you go to war, there's a high chance of you dying. So why are so many people doing it? All right. And then you think, okay, well, part of the explanation is um, the government, that we have governments, because that means that the people who are deciding whether we go to war are not the same as the people who are going to be shot at. Right? Like the leaders get to decide that the country is going to war, but the leaders themselves almost never die in the war and lots of other people die instead. So that is part of the explanation, you know, but also um, it's kind of weird because primitive societies had wars at which, you know, people would voluntarily go and raid another tribe. So it seems like there's some kind of aggressive impulses in human nature. Um, you know, but this came up in the problem of political authority because I wanted to talk about whether a society without a government could be safe, you know, or are they just going to be immediately attacked by societies that do have governments? Um, and, you know, I think that in earlier times that would have been the case, but I think that war is becoming less popular as humanity develops. So uh, there are now 15 countries in the world that don't have military forces. And um, you know, they have not all been immediately taken over. Um, so, you know, and then, and then another thing to think about is uh, democracy has been spreading around the world and democracies um, almost never go to war with each other, right? Like there's, there's a few cases that could be considered democracies going to war with each other, right? But very rare. And eventually democracy will probably spread across the world, at which point war will become, interstate war will become almost unheard of, right? So that's a good development. So that's democracy spreading view. I think that's the, uh, what is it, the end of history, Fukuyama type uh, view. I don't, I don't share that in the sense that I as with all of the things when I mentioned the marginality, I don't think democracy, uh, setting aside the discussion we had earlier about whether that gives some kind of moral authority to the state, there's a, the practical issue of democracy not being a you know an endpoint but a continuum. And as you alluded to, if you don't have anyone to vote for who represents your particular views, while well, democracy for you is particularly weak, it's also weaker in places that have winner-takes-all systems versus the more par parliamentarian systems where you can get proportional representation and even niche views can be expressed. So it is, in my view, a continuum from a, a sort of, I guess the extreme case would be a very local system where you yourself could represent yourself uh, and you always had some representation to the national level where your vote is completely meaningless and you are essentially constrained to two candidates who don't represent your views either way. Uh, so, so on that continuum, democracy may be spreading, but I don't think it's the kind of democracy that's the more that is the more local high level of control democracy. It's more the democracy almost as a as an artifice, as a as a construction that's pointed to in order to say, oh well you had a choice, you people, and this is what you chose. Yeah. So I mean you're you're raising an important point that there's sort of degrees of democraticness or there, there are variations in the quality of democracy that one has, which, you know, um, social scientists are aware of and, and look at. Um, 
but uh, the world is overall getting more democratic, right? Even though like the countries that are called democracies are not necessarily fully democratic or they're you know, not necessarily high quality democracies, right? Uh, some other things that I note, you know, there's like the practice of gerrymandering in the United States. The United States is considered a relatively high quality democracy, but we still do this thing where the party in power redraws district boundaries in order to skew um, election results, right? In order to maximize their own representation in the legislature. Right. And they're continually changing the rules of who does and doesn't get to vote in on the basis of how that's going to benefit the prevailing powers. At any rate, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another thing, right? Like not everyone gets to vote. Okay. So like uh, felons for, or former felons do not get to vote. Um, green card holders who are like legal residents, but not citizens don't get to vote. Children don't get to vote. Um, and, you know, many of the policies of the government affect people in other countries, but those people don't get to vote. They don't get any say in the policies that will be affecting them. Future generations are affected by policies that are passed today, but the future generations don't have a vote. They will get a vote later, but they will like they will inherit this set of laws that they didn't have any role in making. Right. OK, so, um, you know, ver various ways in which the democracy is not not perfect, right? Sort of like flawed. Um, you know, when you're in high school, you learn this stuff about how great our democracy is and how everyone has a, a chance to participate and whatever. Um, in America, anybody can become the president. And it's just, if you believe that, it's just a total amazing coincidence that, you know, we had two presidents who were both named Bush. And then after that, there was a major political candidate who was also named Bush, Jeb Bush, right? And then also in the same year, another of the major political candidates was the wife of a former president. <laughs> like, what a coincidence. Yeah, that would certainly have to go in the measure of the strength of the democracy is the extent to which it just happens to look exactly like a, a system of emperors that uh, that come and go of, of royal families that uh, that alternate back and forth. Yeah, so I mean, this is partly because, um, well, like in America, the system is controlled by parties, political parties, and there are certain families that just have more influence in the parties, so they're more likely to be able to, you know, get one of their members the nomination, and then the people just get to choose between these candidates that they were given by the elites. They don't get to vote for just anyone, right? Um, so you know, flawed democracy. However, with all that being said, it's better than what, what most people have had throughout most of history, right? It's like, it's not the best system. The best system is anarcho-capitalism. However, uh, it's a lot better than the worst system, which is dictatorship, which we've had for almost all of history, all right? And in particular, um, it's better for the, for the war situation, right? Now, America is an unusual country in many respects, and one of those is being unusually hawkish. OK, so America has had like a bunch of wars in the past couple of decades, um, but most democratic countries would not be doing that, partly because it's unpopular. Right. And even if you have this sort of flawed democracy where the elites are kind of skewing election results and so on, um, still war is generally unpopular. The American elites have kind of gotten away with it because um, the impact of the war on us here in America has been pretty minimal. Right. We don't feel the pain and the losses that we have in terms of human life are, are certainly much smaller than the losses abroad of our actions. Right. Yeah. So, you know, like we go to war in Iraq and we kill 300,000 civilians over there, but 300,000 Americans don't get killed. Maybe a few thousand American soldiers get killed. And then that's sort of like um, acceptable to most Americans. Right. But, you know, even that, if that number went up, it would become unacceptable. If we had 50,000 American soldiers dying, I think American, the, the public would not accept that. Let's let's go back to the tribal thing for a moment, because this interests me. And suppose that you are the leader of a tribe, uh, and what is your moral responsibility? Is it to the members of some other tribe? Is it to your tribe? To what extent... Do you feel morally constrained when it comes to acting in ways that do things like that? Suppose, like setting aside the specifics of the Iraq war, which I think is is now 
should be certainly universally considered a a huge huge mistake and a massive amount of destruction for uh, for no real gain but it's putting yourself as sort of the chief of a particular tribe and thinking well either we slaughter all of them or they slaughter us to what extent does your morality constrain you and to what extent is your moral obligation simply to protect your people even if that means taking proactive actions that are extremely harmful to the ones around you that are not members of your tribe yeah um um i mean I believe in self-defense. So like, if you have good reason to think this other tribe is going to attack you, I think it's okay to attack them first, but I don't think that it's okay to do that just, just because you saw another tribe, right? And you go and like, I don't think that it's sufficient to say, oh, there's some people over there. They might attack us someday. We have to attack them now. Like that doesn't seem right. But like, if you have evidence, I don't, I don't know what the evidence would be, right? Um, or if they already attacked you and you're organizing a retaliatory raid, that seems permissible. Um, but like really, what we really want is we want to get out of that, right? Although like people at the time when they were living in primitive societies probably didn't imagine that you could get out of this situation, right? Like they didn't imagine the situation that we today actually live in where there's very little war, right? We're hardly affected by it at all. Right. But yeah, really, like that should be our first concern. How can we get out of this thing of our tribes fighting with each other? Like maybe we can get away from each other. Maybe we can make a peace treaty or something. I don't know. Maybe they can like make an alliance. My own view about that is that to a large extent, what tends to tamp down the amount of warfare between tribes is internal enforcement. So young young men are always up for a raiding party, would be another way to put it. They're always up for going out and stealing some women and cattle and horses or whatever. Uh, it's fun. It's exciting. They like the violence. But what keeps that from happening all the time and everywhere is that the tribe itself, the leaders know that this is not in the end going to benefit them. It'll cause retribution. Um, and so they take it upon themselves to either punish people who go and do that and, and show that to the other tribe that they've taken care of it internally, or to create a culture in which there's there's widespread disapproval of that kind of action so that those people are not going to be as tempted to just go out and, you know, and, and rampage um, against some other tribe. What I see right now is the breaking down of that kind of internal enforcement. The United States is and always has been a set of tribes, but that tribalism was kept in check and it was diverted. You know, you have things like sports as a way of diverting that energy um, and those hostilities. But you, you also have just a general feeling that in, you know, in politics and in other ways, well, we're going to attack them, but we're going to limit it to certain ways. We're not going to wage all out warfare against the people who disagree with us. We are going to hold the members of our own tribe or political party in check. I see that breaking down right now. And I see that the, you know, that, that the people who are out there on the fridges on those, I guess, metaphorical war parties, uh, they come back in and they're not really being sanctioned. They're not being kicked out of the tribe. They're kind of running it. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Um, you know, you reminded me of uh, what I heard about prison gangs. You know, like when you go into a prison, you have to join a gang because uh, if you don't, then it's like open season on you. Like anybody can attack you. <laughs> so you have to join a gang um, so that you can have protection. And then um, there's like some rules inside the prison that are imposed by the gangs. And like if you break the rules, then your own gang punishes you. And they do that to prevent a war with the other gang. Right. So like. You know, if you co commit disrespect against a member of another gang, then your own gang punishes you. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's um, you know, sounds like that's a kind of like general human solution, right, to the problem of warfare. Your comment about the contemporary political tribes, so to speak, um, that's, 
you know, that seems right. Seems like a problem. Like the most extreme members of the warring ideological tribes are kind of like taking over. You know, I'm thinking about like I think about why that happened and what we could do about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it happened partly because the extremists um, care enough to try to take over. And like moderates are not, because they're less passionate, they're not going to put in the work to try to take over the group, right? I think that's a root problem in democracy and in any in any society that's ruled by by the mob, because the people who form the mob are really, by definition, the people who are the most agitated. Yeah, no, that's right. So, you know, thinking about, um, you know, you can, like, you can shrink the government, you can decentralize government so that, like, there's, you know, decision making at the level of an individual neighborhood. And even in my anarcho-capitalist um, you know, society that I imagine, I still expect there to be stuff like that, like local homeowners associations. And then they get taken over by the busybodies who have nothing else to do with their life. And uh, those people are probably not the best people to be, to be running anything because the whole reason they're doing that is that they don't have other things to do right, with their lives, which means they're not that good at running things, right? Like the people who'd really be good at running it are running some big company or whatever, you know, they're doing some big responsibility in the world. Um, and they're, you know, they're just not going to take time to run for the board of the homeowners association anyway. So, uh, and like the, you know, the qualifications for, for taking over a big company are, um, you have to be like competent. You have to be good at making money and stuff like that. The competent, the qualifications for taking over like a political tribe are, just like being an extremist, being super emotional, like making a lot of trouble for other people if you don't get your way. It's like that's the way that organization works, right? So this seems to me a an argument in favor of all political power being uh, allotted by lot, uh, by lottery, essentially, in a rotating fashion which I'm somewhat sympathetic to if we are to have people who have power over other people, that it doesn't come from the people who are the the most um, vocal or who are the best at persuading other people that they deserve to be leaders, but just uh, from a representative sample of people themselves. Yeah. I mean, the only problem with that is, of course, that the average person is stupid. So, um, and actually like if you, if you taught, um, political philosophy classes and then you saw some of the political ideas that, uh, random students have, you would start to feel way more scared about giving random people political power. It's like, you know, like I, I sometimes think, oh, the politicians are pretty dumb and lame, but then when I compare them to things that, you know, random students come up with. I'm like, wow, whew, so lucky, so lucky we don't have, <laughs> so lucky I don't have one of these random people <laughs> making decisions. I suppose that is a trade-off, though, when you when you select as we do now for the people who are best at uh, accumulating power. Then they may be smart, but what they're mostly smart at is getting power and extending that power and using it to enrich themselves. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, so, you know, like, yeah, the people who are in the government are the people who are best at gathering power for themselves. However, they are also sort of steeped in this elite culture. They can be influenced by the views of other elites who are not politicians. Like they could be influenced by um, professors, authors, journalists, whatever. Um, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because right now it certainly doesn't look like a good thing. It looks like a, a system, one unified system with one unified voice. And uh, that's not a good thing. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, so like when when you compare elite opinion to like what you imagine as the utopia, like the you know current elites seem bad, but when you compare it to like average people, they seem really good. Okay, so <laughs> like so you know, this is like an example I got. Like um, you know, a student suggested. Yeah, no one should be allowed to have more than $250,000. Like, that's a proposal. Let's modify our society so that that's a rule. Okay, so now 
that is a complete non-starter in um, you know among the elites who are running the society. Like that would not be considered for a second. <laughs> Okay, but that's the sort of thing ordinary people will come up with. Uh, this is another idea I got from a student. Um, there should be only three possible income levels. Like everyone should like by law should have to be paid one of three levels, high, medium, or low. Like, okay, why not make it just all equal, everyone having the same? And the student was like, well, because you know, you need an incentive for people to work harder. So I'm going to allow three income levels. <laughs> like, okay. Um, but anyway. You know, if, if any of these ideas were tried, it would like completely destroy our society. Yeah, I, I certainly see what you're saying, though. I'm not sure whether that's an argument against uh, the lottery system of selecting uh, people in power or an argument against uh, our system of education as it's been constituted. Yeah. Um, so here, here's a you know different suggestion. Like, um, it's often better if you select people to select someone else, right? So like you could get, you might be able to get better results if you picked random people and then those random people deliberate among themselves about who should make the real decision. See what I mean? Like, because the random people may not themselves have great policy ideas, but they might be able to recognize people who are smart and, you know, have a, have a good moral sense or something. Isn't that just the representative democracy that we, in theory, have? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is like, is like democracy, except the problem with democracy is that everybody knows that their vote makes no difference. And because everybody knows that, they don't bother to make any effort. There are some people who pretend not to know this, right? Say, every, every vote matters, okay. But everyone knows that the probability of your actually deciding the outcome is you know, approximately zero. Um, but you you... You could, you could get people paying more attention and like making a serious effort if there were a smaller number of people making the decision. Well, certainly if there were a smaller number of people voting, perhaps one of my most controversial uh, opinions, um, and I guess that's saying quite a bit, is that voting should be limited to what basically are the four Ps, uh, parents, property owners, prisoners, and patriots who served in the military, because that is the set of people who definitively have skin in the game. Wow, prisoners. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. These are the people who have skin in the game in terms of the voting. They have the most at stake in terms of the decisions that are made. And they've all put themselves in a position where they are now, um, they are now either suffering the consequences or have stepped up and taken responsibility and ownership of society. Right. I mean, when, when you, well, I, I don't know if we want to spend time debating this, but you know, wouldn't you be worried that like criminals would have too much of an influence on policy? No, not at all. Because if you have a society in which 50% or more of the population is prisoners, then you have, you have a, a poisonous society that should be completely reworked or abolished. That's a prison society, right? If the prisoners have enough political power to completely determine who gets elected, well, that means you have way too many people in prison relative to the other categories. No, of course the prisoners don't have a majority. They're, they're, they're a fraction of a percent of our society, right? But uh, a lot of elections are close. And so, like, you know, they in some elections they could tip they could tip the balance, right? Well, you always have to have someone who could tip the balance. Otherwise you wouldn't yeah. have, you know, you wouldn't yeah. even have voting, right? They're always, that's actually part of Arrow's theorem, I think, that yeah. you, you have to choose. And one, one of the choices that you inevitably end up with is that you have one person who it comes down to who can swing, you know, who can swing things if you're trying yeah. to set up a, a system. So I'm not particularly concerned about the argument that, you know, that this lets them run the tables any more than, you know, than any of the other three categories of people yeah, no. able to run the table. Yeah, no, I'm not saying that they dominate over all the other groups. <laughs> so any group could like swing the election in a close election. OK, mm -hmm. but uh, so it's not a, and it's not a problem per se that somebody could swing the outcome of the election. But um, the thing is that like in the case where they do swing the outcome of the election, won't they swing it in a bad 
direction because they're basically antisocial people, right? Like, like most prisoners are basically antisocial. Like, you know, like maybe we don't want their votes in there. Um, they are, they may or may not have harmed society, but they are absolutely being harmed by society. And as such, they deserve representation. No, I mean, that's true. They are, they're definitely being harmed. Yeah. Ultimately, this is a consequentialist thing for me, which is my own philosophic take. You talk a little bit about that in uh, some of your writings, the idea being that uh, for me, what happens, what matters is the, the consequences. And to me, the consequences of letting everybody vote seem pretty bad. The consequences of limiting it to stakeholders in certain ways, they seem better, though you know, not, not necessarily perfect. And that applies when looking at any of this stuff. The question's not necessarily, you know, is it is it moral, but what, you know, what are the consequences of doing this versus the consequences of not doing this? And then that gets wrapped up in probability and I end up down a rabbit hole, but that's, that's where I see it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, like, like the most important thing would be decentralization, right? So like uh, a major reason why people are not paying attention in national elections is that there's just too many people voting. Right. And that, and that problem isn't solved. If, like we reduce the electorate by 50%, that you still have the same problem, right? It has to be reduced drastically. The only way for this to go is like, we have to have um, government be at a very small level, right? If we have government at all. Right. So like, you know, like if you were voting for, um, your local, the people on, in your local homeowners association, like the board of the HOA, then there might be a point to thinking about it, right? If there's like 500 votes total, then there's actually a chance that your vote would make a difference. Non-negligible chance, right? Right. So like, I, I would like, you know, kind of political or quasi-political decision-making, whatever, to be down at a very more local level. Well, we may see that coming to pass right now, one of the potentially positive side effects of the uh, of the COVID regimes is that it it's not being applied equally everywhere, though certainly there are a lot of forces at the national level that would like things to be applied equally everywhere. But we're now seeing that not all states are equal, um, and that might lead to not all municipalities are equal and, and push things down to the local level. Yeah. I mean, you know, like part of the purpose of um, federalism, part of the purpose of having all these states was so that they could do things differently. <laughs> like, you know, you're defeating the point of the federal system if it's uniform, right? Because if you have different states doing things differently, then people can observe the results. And like, then they could, they could see what worked well and what didn't, right? Um, but it works better if you make it even more decentralized, if it varies from one town to another or one neighborhood to another. Certainly does. Anything else to add? Um, I don't know, just, uh, you know, everybody uh, go buy my books. Tell, tell the audience a little bit more about that. What are your other books? Where, where can they go to find them? Yeah, you know, go to my Amazon page. Uh, I have a recent introduction to philosophy book called uh, Knowledge, Reality, and Value, which is um, more affordable than my other books because I published it myself. Excellent. Well, I hope everybody goes and checks that out. Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yep. Thanks for having me.